process, we looked at some math preliminaries. Uh, stuff, we looked at uh, limit cycles from dynamical systems and then limit cycles. So in limit cycles, we looked at uh, a sort of a special case, an example of the Hopf oscillator. And after that, we looked at a slightly more general case of the Reynolds oscillators. There are a couple of other theorems which we, we need to discuss. We'll discuss them later when we actually come to uh, describing your own models which involve limit cycle oscillations. So I thought we'll take a break from math and then get back to biology. So now we are preparing ground to describe a very important single neuron model called the Horst Nexley model, right? Uh, before that, we need to first look at a little bit about uh, the biology of a single neuron, right? What what, what is a neuron? What is, uh, what is its signal, right, uh, to other neurons and all these things? So then we'll uh, try to describe all that mathematically. So there are two important uh, types of brain cells, neurons and glia. Now, actually, it should also involve uh, blood vessels in the brain uh, because vascular system also seems to be contributing to neural to the brain function, right? And what we call brain function, the sensory, motor, cognitive, all that, right? It seems to get very important contributions from vascular system. But anyway, traditionally, uh, traditionally, only neurons were thought to be involved in brain function, brain's computations, but for the last, say, 25 years or 30 years, people have been giving importance to glial cells, right? And uh, more, like more recently, maybe last decade or so, there is more interest, attention paid to the vascular network also. So neuron is a relatively active cell. Uh, it has a lot of wires sticking out of it. And uh, so if you look at, uh, and so there are lots of neurons. In the adult brain has 100 billion neurons. This estimate, as we is turned, it's been found, is slightly an overestimate, and more uh, conservative estimate would be something like 85 billion neurons in adult brain. Compared to that, a smaller creature like Aplysia, right, a sea creature, has about 18,000 to 20,000 neurons. A leech has about 300 neurons. C. elegans or a nematode has 302 neurons, which is a nice. Therefore, it's a very nice uh, a neuroscience model organism because it's a small nervous system, small number of connections. So it's very nice to work out, map the entire nervous system and do some studies. This cell, the size of the neurons uh, varies uh, a lot. You know, four microns in a granule cell to 100 microns, a motor neuron cell in the spinal cord. When we talk about a neuron size, we, what we mean is the cell body, the central part of the neuron. The neuron has a lot of wires sticking out, and the wire can be pretty long sometimes. Uh, uh, this wiring of a single neuron can sometimes be like a few feet long. That means it's, you should treat it actually as a cell that is a few feet long, which is huge. So what is so interesting and so fascinating about a neuron in terms of its size compared to other some standard run of the mill kind of uh, cells is its shape, right? Because if you want to understand why is brain so special, I mean, it's, you say it's made up of neurons. Then you ask, what is those neurons? Because uh, neurons also have a uh, cell body and a cell membrane and the nucleus and nucleolus. It also has the same number of chromosomes and the same genome. That by all this. If that is the case, and it also all the other organelles, right, uh, cytoskeleton, uh, mitochondria, and Golgi bodies, and the bodies, bodies. Standard paraphernalia present in any cell are also present in the neuron. So why is it so special, right? Why does an you know, organ which has these kind of cells have become so special? So you know, detailed reason why it's special. Let's look at some pictures of different kinds of cells. So here, uh, bacillus, uh, bacterium, paramecium, right? They, they are a typical cell is a blob, a fluid fluid blob, shapeless. But if you look at some bacterial cells, they're like rods. Uh, uh, cells also can slightly extended. They are not like a blob, but has an interesting structure. And then skeletal muscle is like strings, short strings. And RBC is like a little and, uh, uh, something like that, uh, or a donut. Right? And uh, a bone marrow cell has little stringy substance. Right? It's not like a blob. But uh, no, none of the cells compare with the the uh, like the intrig intriguing nature of uh, neuron 
because like any other cell, it has a cell body, as you can see in this picture. In addition to the cell body, there's a lot of wires coming out, and uh, which makes which gives it a very rich uh, morphology. So, for example, in this figure, figure A is a unipolar cell, whereas the cell body and a single wire sticking out in small branches. Nothing very complex. But the bipolar cell has wires sticking out in both directions and some wire at both ends. And there's some tension. Uh, then, but if you look at uh, this is a pyramidal cell, very important neuron type, commonly called It has cell body. Has, uh, Close to the cell body, far from the cell body, you have right you know basal dendrites are close to the cell body, and apical dendrites are far from the cell body. So it's it has a lot of wire. It's pretty rich in its morphology, and the richest and uh, you know almost like a, a peacock, of, uh, right of the neuron families, uh, is the, the Purkinje cell in cerebellum. It has very rich harbor uh, about about two lakh connections per cell. So, so neurons vary a lot in, in terms of their, their morphologies, but what is common to them is the cell body with some wires sticking out and going in all directions. So a typical neuron is described like this. There's a cell body, and there is wire going in both directions. And uh, on one side, usually the wire is shorter in length, and uh, the branching is, more, is richer. And, that is the, and these set of wires are called dendrites. On the other side, usually there is a long wire sticking out, going far from the cell body. And uh, at the end of that wire, the long wire branches out into many branches. And uh, so this is called an axon. And the branch of the axon are called axon petals. Right? And so you have cell body, it's on one side, axon on the other side, axon collaterals, which are the branches of the axon. So these axon collaterals, terminate in a small which is called the axon terminal right and this is where it ends up with the dendrites of the neuron and this contact point which is very small is called a synapse and we have looked at the idea of a synapse in one of the previous classes there's a lot of debate about that and how does one neuron make contact with another neuron what is that gap like and all that we have discussed before so that that little gap that junction point is called a synapse so if we take a closer look at the synapse, you have, uh, again, this is the tip of an axon, this is axon terminal, and this is a small segment of a dendrite of another neuron. So the junction point between the tip of the axon of one neuron, the dendrite of another neuron, is this is the synapse. The tip of the axon, which, which is the tip of the pipe. Hello. Sir? And, yeah. Sir, your audio signal is actually breaking up at times. I'm not able to hear the words. No, my problem is I, we don't have net connection at home today. I'm using my cell phone. Sure. I think maybe there's a right. So let me, there's nothing I can do. There's nothing at home. Campus network is not. Campus network Yeah, it is uh, breaking, sir. The voice is breaking a little bit. Now, yeah, it was, and uh, now it is, uh, no, it is breaking, sir. I'm sorry, it's a I mean, technology problem. Uh, whole day it is like been like that. I've had some meetings, but with just my cell phone. Yeah, now it is fine. I think uh, the position of that, uh, maybe where you are kept matters, the signal is coming or something like that. Uh, maybe. No, I haven't told. Okay, 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 fine, fine. So, so let me go on for a few more minutes and if it's very bad, we'll stop and we'll continue next class. Okay, okay, sir. Okay, so, um, yeah, so the tip of the axon uh, actually flattens out a little. Right, and uh, the the contact point on, on the dendrite also flattens out a little, and these two flattened parts uh, make a very nice contact. But without this kind of a flattening, you won't have a tight contact between the terminal axon and the dendrite on the other side. Okay, and this kind of flattened contact 
because the is the chemical and it's through that chemical uh, signal to the first synaptic the to the synthetic side right and uh, if there is no flattened contact if there is no tight contact then whatever chemical is released by the ion terminal here will leak out and uh, just you know wasted by this you can get dissipated in the cellular space right so to enable every uh, transmission right, of chemical signal from one neuron to another nature seems to have designed this kind of a very nice uh, flat and tight contact therefore the presynaptic terminal now ends up looking like a button right therefore it is called a button but from french and therefore the on the dendritic side this flattened structure uh, is called a spine because it's like something that is elevated uh, coming out of the out of the pipeline called the dendrite okay so now talking about uh, neuron signaling uh, the first thing we need to remember is that the neuron is an electrically active cell in fact uh, any cell has some electricity that right? it has an electrical act electrical activity in the sense there is a voltage difference between inside of the cell and outside of the cell this is true for pretty much any cell but neuron is special in the sense uh, this voltage difference which is normally a constant value it is in under what is called a resting condition of the neuron right on stimulation it's uh, start showing rapid fluctuations okay and it is through these fluctuations of the voltage that neuron signal to to each other. So, uh, so normally it is the resting on a the voltage signal becomes a wave right and the wave propagates along these wires Right. And uh, so that is one way by which uh, signal propagates over a neuron, over the wires of a neuron. All right, and uh, the way this electrical wave propagates over the neuron's body, right, because the body can be pretty, pretty long, pretty large sometimes, uh, is different in different parts of the neuron based on the local infrastructure present in that part of the neuron. Uh, the propagation over the dendrites is usually lost. In the sense that, uh, as the signal propagates, the amplitude of the signal usually drops, uh, and it reduces in size, and the width of the signal. The, suppose I inject the current in the in a, in a dendritic cable, it will produce a small voltage wave, a sharp voltage wave like this. Now that voltage wave starts propagating along the dendrite, and as it propagates, the amplitude goes down, and the the width of the signal also expands and flattens out. Right as it gets dissipated along the wire, right. So this is uh, this is called a lossy propagation because as the voltage wave propagates along the cable, it loses energy. That's why it becomes uh, loses amplitude and becomes flatter. There are in some other parts in in the axonal part of the neuron, the propagation is non-lossy, as we'll see soon. Right, the signal uh, propagates intact. It doesn't. Uh, Change its shape as it propagates along the axon. <clears throat> now, so that is something that we have just said about how the signal propagates on the dendritic side and on the axonal side. Now, let us talk about uh, something interesting that happens at the meeting point of the dendritic side and the axonal side. So, the cell body is sits exactly in the middle of the dendritic side and the axonal side, and uh, more precisely, if you look at the junction point of the cell body and the axon, this little swollen region called the axon hillock, right? Something interesting happens there. Uh, if you actually you can experiment with it and to test that, you can penetrate it with an, an electrode, a microelectrode, and pass some current into it and see what happens. Uh, so if you inject some current into it, right, uh, in, in, in the form of a say, small current pulse, Right, the rest it will, it will produce a small change in the voltage because uh, so so this is a kind of a you can think of it as some kind of a capacitance, right? Uh, the uh, can you see my cursor? So you see this bond of the cell is cell membrane, right? And cell membrane has uh, two lipid layers, a lipid bilayer. So you can think of it as a parallel plate capacitor. Now the entire membrane can be thought of as a, a parallel plate capacitor. So, and it's insulating, 
right? So the charges cannot just directly you know, go through the membrane. You need to have special infrastructure called ion channels for charges to go from inside to outside or outside to inside. Okay, so so you can think of the cell or a neuron as a pal as a palpate capacitor. So if you inject charges into it, that will increase the voltage. If you inject a positive current into the into the cell body, right, it will increase the local voltage. So so let us see what happens if you do that. So I inject a small pulse of a current, right? In response to that, voltage also increases. So I, in here, I increase a small, introduce a small pulse of a current. In response to that, the voltage of the cell also goes up slightly. So resting value is minus 70. Because I've injected a small current, this voltage also goes up slightly and comes back. So now we, I inject a slightly stronger current pulse in the, into the cell. So then the voltage also in, increases a little bit more and before it falls, falls out falls back to the baseline. Then I keep on increasing my input current amplitude. In response, the voltage amplitude also keeps increasing. As you keep on increasing your input current amplitude, you will reach at some kind of a threshold point where the response of the voltage will not be just a simple return to the baseline. It will suddenly increase to an abnormally high value, right? And normally the voltage is negative, right? But, uh, once the input stimulation crosses a certain threshold, this increase in the voltage increases in a disproportionate fashion, it goes beyond zero, goes to some positive value. Before it quickly drops back to the negative values, uh, goes below even 70 and goes to say minus 80, minus 90, and so on, and comes back. So normally the cell is in negative polarity, right? And you, you right? And uh, and when the stimulation input stimulation processes a certain threshold amplitude, the cell goes to positive polarity, and so it is said to be depolarized, and it comes back to the negative again and goes less than its normal level of negative voltage, and therefore it is called hyperpolarization before it comes back to the baseline. So it's it. Performs a whole, a whole complicated dance, right? When the input uh, pulse, input stimulation crosses a threshold. Until then, it shows a very simple uh, blip in response to the current pulse. So this kind of a response of a neuron is called an all or none response. That is, uh, when the input pulse is less than some amplitude, the response is also very small. But once the input pulse passes some amplitude, the response is huge, and it's like complete response, right? And it, it comes. Back. You can think of it as uh, so this property of a neuron is called excitability, right? Neuron is said to be excitable because uh, you know once input pulse threshold, it will produce this standard pulse, uh, which is incidentally called an action potential. You can think of a human analog to this process. Right. Uh, imagine a situation where you are studying seriously for an exam, and a friend comes and asks you, "Hey, let's go watch a movie. There's a nice movie coming on TV." Right, and uh, you say, "No, no, I'm busy. It don't disturb me now." Then he actually nudges you and says, "Hey, come on, what? You don't be a bookworm. Let's go and watch a movie." Then you also slightly raise your voice and say, "Hey, buzz off. No, don't disturb." Me. And your friend does it, uh, like you know, over a few trials. With increasing amplitude, uh, beyond a point, you lose your patience. Right? You you yell at him, you bawl at him, ask him to get lost, get out of your room. Right? And once you do that, to do your song and dance, you could, when the threshold is crossed, uh, that's like a standard dance. Right? You'll hit your maximum. You'll hit the ceiling in your response because you got excited. You got uh, you're triggered by that uh, by that input which crossed some 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 line. So neuron exactly behaves like that. And it's a very fundamental event in neural signaling. Uh, so this is called an all or none response. So this kind of a response is produced uh, roughly you know, in this region of axon law, right? And you can test that by injecting current here uh, into the cell body. And once an action potential is generated at the axon field, it uh, sort of propagates along the axon and goes over the axon. And uh, so the way it goes along the axon is uh, quite interesting. Unlike on the dendritic side, where the impulse loses amplitude and also spreads in time, on the axonal side, there is no change. You see that uh, if you measure the voltage, 
right? As the voltage wave passes this point, you can measure how voltage changes. The voltage comes from some somewhere at this end of it. Uh, so once it reaches here, it goes to a maximum and comes back here. So you see, this is what the observer measuring the voltage at this point sees this, this purple curve. An observer seeing the voltage wave at this point, V2, measures this green curve, which is identical to the purple curve. Similarly, observer at uh, this point, V3, sees an identical thing, identical uh, variation of voltage. So there's no loss of amplitude, no loss of, uh, no spreading of the wave. It, the wave marches on like you know quite royally like a like a military position right along the axon. This happens because the axon has special infrastructure, special molecular and chemical infrastructure, which will keep charging the signal as it propagates along the axon. We'll discuss all this in mo more detail later. It kind of looks like this, uh, what you see in the simple animation, right? the action potential marching along the axon uh, from the soma or the cell body to the tip of the axon. So once the action potential reaches the end of the axon, it arrives at the axon terminal, right, the button, right? Uh, this uh, button is also called the presynaptic terminal because once you reach the synapse, you describe everything in terms of the synapse with reference to the synapse. So the action potential propagates along the axon, which is the button, this is the button. This is called the, and this is the synapse. This is the spine of the dendrite on the other side. So now you 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 give new labels to the same thing uh, with reference to the synapse because because this is synapse, this is called the presynaptic terminal, and this is called the postsynaptic terminal because signal goes from this side to this side. So when the action potential comes to the presynaptic terminal, it releases a chemical, right, which then acts on the postsynaptic terminal, and again produces a voltage response on the postsynaptic side. That process is called your neurotransmission, and it involves obviously a chemical release. You remember the classic experiment by Otto Louis, who showed that uh, the signal transmission from the vagus nerve to the heart, right, is a chemical. And what the signal that is transmitted is a chemical, right? That, and that happens pretty much uh, in most synapses. So, so in this at the synapse, what happens is there is a presynaptic signal, which is in the form of an action potential, the sharp wave and which arrives at the presynaptic terminal and uh, then this releases a chemical. The chemical acts on the postsynaptic terminal producing another voltage. Uh, only thing is there's an important difference between the nature of the voltage wave that you see on the dendritic side and the nature of the voltage wave on the presynaptic axonal side. On the presynaptic side, the, the voltage wave, it's a volt, both are voltage waves, but on the presynaptic side, voltage wave is an action potential having it fixed amplitude and duration and shape. On the post-synaptic wave, the voltage wave is not action potential. It's a smoother wave, right? And on the presynaptic side, the wave has fixed uh, size and shape. On the post-synaptic side, the wave has variable shape and variable size, variable duration. It's all graded. The signal on the post-synaptic side is graded. The signal on the presynaptic side is fixed. It's like binary, whether it's there or not there. So this signal that you find on the post-synaptic side is called the post-synaptic potential or PSP. Okay, here again, there are two kinds of PSPs based on the nature of the synapse, right? And there are two different kinds of synapses. If the, in one kind of a synapse, the post-synaptic potential is a, is a positive wave. That is, it is greater than the baseline value of minus 70 millivolts. In other kind of a synapse, it's a negative wave that is, it goes below that minus 70 millivolts. The thing is, on the presynaptic side, the, the voltage wave, the action potential is always the same. It's always positive. It always goes above minus 70 to some positive value and comes back. But on the post-synaptic side, the wave can be a positive deviation or a negative deviation. Now, if it is a positive deviation, then the, poten the potential, the PSP is called excitatory post-synaptic potential. And if it is a negative deviation, it is called inhibitory post-synaptic potential. This difference arises because of the nature of the synapse, the nature of the chemistry that occurs inside the synapse. We'll describe that in detail later. So this the synapse at which on the post-synaptic side you have an EPSP, right? And such a synapse is called an excitatory synapse. And uh, uh, the synapse are where 
you have an IPSP on the postsynaptic side, right? It's called an inhibitory synapse. So whether it's IPSP or, or EPSP uh, depends on the nature of the synapse. Well, that depends whether the synapse is excitatory or inhibitory. So like I just said, uh, the EPSP IPSPs are graded potentials. They can have variable amplitudes. They can have variable uh, shapes and durations and all that. But uh, the on the presynaptic side, the voltage signal has a fixed shape and size as section potential. <laughs> now let us look at put all these things together and uh, try to get a picture of what happens when a neuron signals. So here uh, we are we are looking at a yellow neuron. I mean, it's just a color coding, right? And uh, which gets input from a red neuron and a blue neuron. It turns out that the synapse from the red neuron to the yellow neuron is excitatory, so indicated by this plus sign. And the synapse from the blue neuron to the yellow neuron is inhibitory, indicated by this minus sign. So now what we do is we activate uh, the uh, excitatory uh, exit neuron, the red neuron, and see what happens. The red neuron is activated, and uh, we are measuring from here, right? Um, so here. So therefore, uh, it produces action potential, which propagates along this axon, arrives at the yellow neuron. So that action potential is shown as this red curve. Right? And the standard shape and size. Now, because of the action potential, and some chemical is released here, and, and uh, it produces a PSP on the postsynaptic side in this neighborhood. right? And so there, the since it's an exactly snapped, the PSP is also positive, so you get an EPSP or a postsynaptic potential. That wave looks like this. EPSP is positive. So this is what you observe in the neighborhood of this synapse, right in the yellow neuron. Now, so now see what happens when I activate the blue neuron. So I activate the blue neuron, I'm measuring the action potential in the blue neuron. So that's blue curve, the action potential. That goes to that in the yellow neuron. I measure somewhere here, right? And I see the synapse is an inhibitory synapse, right? In the neighborhood, the voltage deviation is negative. So the, the yellow curve here, which shows the response to the inhibitory signal, right, is also negative. You get an IPSP. So you see that a given neuron can receive input from uh, neurons of different types. It can receive inputs from excitatory neurons or inhibitory neurons. Excitatory neurons as you can see in this figure, tend to increase the membrane voltage of this fellow. Inhibitory neurons tend to decrease the membrane voltage of this fellow. So all these things, right, all these inputs coming from other neurons will have some kind of a net effect. And what happens is, as we have seen in case of the all or none response, if the input current injected into the cell body, if it is less than a threshold, the neuron doesn't fire, there's no action potential generation. But if the input current crosses a threshold, then the neuron gets excited and there's action potential generation from the axon hillock. After that, the action potentials propagate down the axon. This is one of the two things that can happen. So the, all the inputs that come to a given neuron, that all the pluses and minuses, they add up. And that process is called spatial summation. That is, input coming from various neurons to so this neuron, right, are all spatially distributed on the body of the neuron. So these inputs can be making contact on the cell body or far from the cell body on the, on the uh, dendrites. Either way it can, it can happen. So that kind of a summation of inputs from all other neurons that make contact uh, in a spatially distributed fashion is called spatial summation. And not only that, a summation can also occur temporarily. There is uh, no figure here. Yeah, okay, temporarily it can also occur. So for example, here is the dendrite of a neuron and these are the, the horizontal bar is the axon of another neuron. And a given neuron can fire action potentials repeatedly. So they'll come like a bunch of soldiers marching down the, down the street. So each of these action potentials, when it hits synapse, it will produce a small PSP on the post-synaptic side. The thing is, PSP goes up and again comes back to baseline. The thing is, if the second action potential comes and hits the synapse, even before the previous PSP has gone, gone down to zero, 
on the baseline. Uh, then what will happen is the next PSP will start building on top of the previous PSP, which is what you see in this figure. Then the third action potential came and hit the synapse. Then the third PSP will build on top of the second PSP. You see that this PSP will start building right uh, one on top of the other on the postsynaptic side, giving rise to a large amplitude EPSP. So this kind of a summation, which is happening uh, because action potential is coming one after another in time, is called temporal summation. So the temporal inputs add up. First one is called you see the simple schematics where, uh, so in this figure, the neuron gets inputs from two excitatory neurons, two red red guys here, right, and that they, both of them increase the voltage of this neuron to a great extent. Therefore, the neuron gets excited and it sends a signal. It gets triggered and sends a signal. Whereas in this case, in this example. Right, there are two inputs coming from two excitatory neurons, and two inputs coming from two inhibitory neurons. Right, all of our can roughly cancel out, and therefore the and maybe the inhibitory ones are even stronger than the excitatory ones. Therefore, the net voltage is actually less than the baseline value, as you can see in this meter, this nanometer. Therefore, the neuron doesn't get excited. So this is basically how neuron uh, works. So in this example again. There are three excitatory inputs and two inhibitory inputs. The excitatory inputs seem to have overpowered or dominated the inhibitory inputs. So therefore, the galvanometer is showing that the membrane voltage is greater than some threshold, has, has crossed a certain threshold. And when that happens, the neuron gets excited and, and produces the action potential, which propagates down the zone. That is the summation. And we also saw the temporal summation. So basically, to summarize, right, a neuron, you can think of it as a kind of a black box, which receives inputs from a lot of other neurons uh, over its uh, dendritic side. And on dendritic side, uh, different neurons make contact with the different dendrites. That injects some current, and that produces PSPs. And these PSPs propagate down the dendrite, come to the neuron cell body. And the neuron cell body, right, uh, it all get integrated. It produces signal or not produce signal. When it produces signal, uh, potential, it propagates on the axon, goes uh, along the axon, right, and branches out on the axon collaterals. And here it reaches a synapse and transmits a signal to the postsynaptic neuron, right. So this is so you can think of a neuron as an input output system. Input comes to the dendritic side, outputs can be read out of the axonal side. So in this whole thing, you can divide the signaling that happens in neuron into four components. The first component is signal propagation along the dendrites. Right? Then signal summation in the cell body or soma. Then signal propagation along the axons. Then signal uh, sig signal uh, transmission across the synapse. So this is what is called neurotransmission. So you see that there are four components. And you can also notice that. Among these four components, the first three, dendrites, uh, cell body, and axon, all three are electrical signaling. Because all three involve simply propagation of, an, of a voltage wave along a cable. Only in the fourth one, a voltage wave on the presynaptic side gets converted into a chemical signal. right? And the chemical signal, again, on the postsynaptic side gets converted back into a voltage signal. So, uh, so this fourth component is a chemical step. Otherwise, other three are electrically electrical signaling steps. So, finally, to summarize, if you have a neuron which has a bunch of dendrites, right, which has gets inputs both from excitatory neurons and inhibitory neurons, if the inhibitory signals dominate the excitatory signals, then the net effect of all these signals on the soma is to keep the voltage negative, or that is less than the baseline value. Then the neuron doesn't get excited, no signal gets generated, so neuron remains silent. But if the positive excitatory signals receive dominate the inhibitory signal, which are negative, then the neuron will get uh, will be able to voltage will be able to cross the threshold, it will get excited, right, and uh, it will be able to generate the action potentials, which then travel along the axon, right, and then by neurotransmission, 
it sends a signal to a postsynaptic neuron. So this is a simple outline of uh, neuron signaling, right? I just made slightly superficial so that you can get the big picture of the neurons. So what I will do since the, sig the signaling today is not very good from my side. So we'll break here. In the next class on Monday, I'll repeat the same thing, but in a more detailed fashion. <clears throat> because if I describe everything in a detailed fashion, it will get lost. It looks uh, too complicated. I want to give the big picture first. Then I'll go over the whole thing by inserting more details in every part of the story. All right? And uh, then we look at the molecular and chemical basis of all this signaling. Today, I didn't talk about the base of the signal. I just said there are signals, and they get like this. But what are the molecular, what is the molecular machinery which generates all these signals? Right, let us discuss that in the next class. Based on that description, we'll be able to put together a mathematical model of how this, these signals are generated. Okay, so that's all for today. Any questions? Yes, sir. One is in the chat box. Yeah. So very good question. So the thing is, uh, uh, yeah, only one technical question. Message is passed from axon to dendrite, or is both ways possible? Actually, all sorts of things are possible. Okay. So the thing is, I didn't want to say it in the first class and confuse people. I mean, I'll tell you uh, that it's possible. Signal can go from axon to axon. Right, and even in axon, if I inject current in the middle of the axon, it will operate in both directions, both towards cell body and towards the axon terminal. So, thing is, since it's a very first class on neuron signaling, I'll try to present a very nice uh, textbook version of the story, very simple story. But as we go deeper into the course, as we, especially as we understand the basis of all the signaling, you'll easily see that uh, the real situation is a lot more complicated. So the answer to it, your question is yes, right? It is uh, possible, but uh, let us live with the simple story for now. Any other questions? Okay, no questions. So then let's meet again on Monday. Right? Uh, so have a nice weekend. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you.